I call David Garrett. Some have said that the government had a relaxed first year, free of fundamental reforms, and that the real work begins now. Well, I would like to at least partially dispute that. In my specialist area of law and order, the change in government has brought with it a major, major change of attitude. There has been in the past year a renewed focus on getting tough on our worst offenders, on cracking down on criminal gangs and on looking after victims rather than paying lip service to their rights. The ACT Party has played a key role in this. Without our input and support, much of this could never have happened. The Prime Minister in his statement, Mr Speaker, talked about the need for sensible government spending to help grow the economy. The key to growing the economy and catching Australia is to allow the private sector to get on with the job. Free of excessively high taxation, free of senseless red tape and, Mr Speaker, free of crime. A firm law and order policy is not just sensible social policy, it is good economic policy too. If we practice zero tolerance on crime, we reduce the cost of crime. A safer society is more productive and everyone will be better off. And yes, locking some people up for longer will cost the government more, a bit more, but this is more than offset by the reduced cost to the private sector. A recent Treasury report, or not so recent, estimating the costs of crime in New Zealand 2003-2004 is an excellent piece of research, and I wish that they were produced more often. The first few sentences of the abstract to that article are most revealing. Quote, we estimate that the total cost of crime in New Zealand in 2003-04 amounted to 9.1 billion. 9.1 billion. Of this, the private sector incurred 7 billion in costs and the public sector 2.1 billion. Close quote. So, Mr. Speaker, it's easy to see there that the costs of crime fall primarily on the private sector. The cost of dealing with offenders, processing them, sentencing them and locking them up is a fraction, in fact about a quarter, of what it costs the private sector. Crime costs the private sector $7 billion a year. And 80% of the cost, Treasury calculate, is the physical and emotional effect of crime on the victims. It comes in their health costs, emotional costs, the impact on their way of life, and also lost output. I'm not talking about burglary or theft, Mr Speaker, I'm talking about serious violent crime. From the abstract again, quote, offences against private property are the most common crimes, but offences against the person are the most costly, accounting for 45% of the total estimated costs of crime, close quote. Crimes against the person, Mr Speaker, include serious violence, sexual offences and aggravated robbery, all soon to be covered in law by the three strikes law recently announced. It is crucial that we continue to reduce crime in all its forms. It is painfully obvious what the social and economic costs of not doing so are. If we go soft on crime, the nation loses at least $74 million a year that could be better spent elsewhere. Is it economically speaking, worth raising corrections and justice costs a little to reduce the burden on the productive sector? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it morally speaking worth, more to punish, uh, worth spending more to punish the worst offenders and prevent them from creating more victims? No question. Three strikes, Mr Speaker, will lock our worst criminals away for much longer. When they are in prison, they are not out on the streets re-offending. Meanwhile, the deterrent effect of the policy will stop others from committing more crimes. Some claim crime is an irrational behaviour. Well, overseas experience shows that a law like this causes people to think before they act. This government has increased the number of police on the beat, is paying greater attention to both ends of the offending scale, got tough on gangs and drug dealers, and made common sense decisions regarding double bunking in prison management. 
Keeping our citizens safe, Mr Speaker, is the most important function government can undertake. ACT has always recognised this. It's in our constitution very prominently. No better example of our impact in this parliament, Mr Speaker, can be found than in the three strikes policy. No, Sir Roger pointed that out to me, uh, Mr whatever your name is over there. ACT campaigned for three strikes for many years and I'm pleased to say that I could play a part in making this policy a reality. For too long, successive governments have given our worst criminals too easy a ride. That ride is shortly to be closed abruptly. Gone are the days of countless chances. We owe the victims of violent crime a far better deal than we've provided them up until now. Criminal apologists, however, are spending, spreading myths about the three strikes policy. Peter Williams, QC, has been painting for us a world where scores of mentally ill and homeless people are filling our prisons beyond overflowing. Well, if he spent more time reading the legislation and less time reading Charles Dickens, he would realise what most people already do. Three strikes targets the worst of the worst. You won't find loitering or pickpocketing anywhere in the list of 36 offences that constitute a strike. I challenge Mr Williams and his ilk to explain why a three-time violent offender shouldn't get 14 years for kidnapping, 20 years for rape or life without parole for the most serious cases of murder. I wish him luck. He'll need it. Meanwhile, the eternally confused Mr Kim Workman first claimed that three strikes would cause the prison population to triple. Similar sort of outlandish claim as was made in California. When challenged, Mr Workman quickly revised his claim and said the increase would be uh, not tripling, 3,000. The reality, Mr Speaker, in the first five years, an estimated 56 of our worst criminals will be affected by three strikes. This rises to 142 after 10 years, 288 after 20, and 433 after 30. One, just over 10 per cent of Mr Workman's revised figure. You can expect, or one can expect, Mr Speaker, the actual figures to be lower. If results from overseas are anything to go by, we can expect a substantial deterrent effect. For, for those who blindly claim there is no such thing from laws like this, there is plenty of material out there to prove otherwise. I draw attention to two of those now, the first of those being the Summer 207 IACJ Journal, which states, quote, the number of third strikers in California declined every year from 1997 to 2003, close quote. Note those dates, Mr Speaker. 1997, you get, begin to get a plummet three years after the law was introduced. A 1999 FBI study also shows that crime overall in California decreased by 27 per cent since three strikes was implemented in 1994. Violent crime by more than 50. Three strikes will imprison more people, Mr Speaker, true, and the cost will modestly increase to the government. But because of deterrence, this initial cost has been shown to be temporary. I am proud, as my ACT colleagues are, to have played a key part in this renewed focus on making and keeping New Zealand safe. It has been a good first year for this government, but there is much more left to do. We most certainly can create... Uh, well, unemployment, you had low unemployment under the previous Labor government, Mr Speaker. Did violent crime decrease as the theory would have it? No, it kept on rising. We most certainly can create a low-tax, high-growth economy that leaves no one behind. Zero tolerance on crime, our next target, has a crucial role to play in this. And I look forward to playing my part in this process. Thank you.